Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. I'd like to welcome our live stream audience and all those that watch it later on video. And it's my pleasure to welcome Edward J. Larson here uh, to speak about his book, Summer for the Gods. Uh, there's a new edition out with a new foreword. Um, it's a book that uh, got many awards uh, 20 years ago when it came out, and it's about the Scopes trial in the 1920s in Tennessee, uh, quite a famous trial. So, Ed, thank you very much for coming back to the Commonwealth Club this time virtually. Happy to be here. I wish I could be actually with you as opposed to just virtually. And we wish we had an audience, but, uh, but here we are. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, this, uh, well, fortunately and unfortunately, unfortunately, the issues that you raise in your book from 100 years ago are still absolutely relevant today. So it's really valuable to go back, see what they did at the time, how they handled it, uh, etc. But I'd like to, to uh, start by uh, talking about one thing, uh, setting the context for the times. When people think of the 1920s, uh, they think of uh, flappers and the Roaring Twenties and so on and so forth. But I think it's really valuable to, to, to understand what the background was for a trial that happened in 1925 in Tennessee. Um, not just the flu pandemic, um, which people didn't talk about, but had just come to an end, therefore made everybody more frightened and so on. Um, but the repression uh, that was caused by the rules uh, that Woodrow Wilson put in place for World War I and other things that you've mentioned. I thought I'd uh, start with a, a quote from Mark Twain. Um, he said, uh, in America we have three unspeakably precious uh, you know, freedoms. The freedom of speech, uh, the freedom of religion, and the freedom and the prudence to ne practice neither of them. <laughs> uh, and and you, you mentioned uh, and that was probably about 1900. So in, in 1919, you mentioned a, a case where Oliver Wendell Holmes was in, uh, uh, on a free speech issue, where our current idea of free speech really wasn't the issue at all for First Amendment rights. And it was only through discussions with Learned Hand, who eventually became a justice himself, uh, that this started to develop. So maybe give a little background on that idea, uh, what happened. Sure, we had a, a very different idea of of what America was all about. And if you would have really asked a Woodrow Wilson or a William Jennings Bryan, or even a Teddy Roosevelt, what, what America meant, what democracy meant, they wouldn't think of, of civil liberties and individual liberties. They would think of democracy. Uh, this was the uh, sort of the near the end of the populist uh, and progressive era of which both Wilson and Roosevelt were part. And uh, that pushed uh, democracy. And the idea that what made America different was that we had, we had the vote and we could, or certain people had the vote, certainly in Tennessee, black people didn't have the vote. Um, women didn't have the vote until just before the Scopes trial. Women at the time of the Scopes trial in Tennessee couldn't serve on juries or couldn't even go in the courtroom for that matter. Um, but um, the idea was that we had adopted things like initiative and referendum, um, there were whole movements of, okay, let's, let's let the people rule to the extent that they got to define who the people were. And there wasn't much in the way of what we would call individual liberties. And so when the war came, World War I, that is, the, the Great War, something like they'd never seen before, uh, Woodrow Wilson, once we went into the war, he adopted an enormous range of repressive legislation that um, would jail anyone who criticized the government, who, um, who uh, uh, in any way obstructed the conscription of troops or the recruitment of troops. Um, it, it then, uh, as the war ended and there was Bolshevik uh, and uh, communism, of course, took over in Russia and threatened other countries, there was a tremendous repression of socialist and communist in the United States. The first Red Square, Red Scare, as it was known, to be, not to be confused with later McCarthyism, which will come back in, which is very much part of the scope story, too, the second era, but the first era. So um, there was a rounding up of radicals and anarchists. Um, there were bombings. There were huge labor strikes. There was the, the disruption caused, and we don't give enough importance to, it wasn't just the war. It was this pandemic that killed hundreds of thousands, 100,000 Americans. Um, and, and laid cities um, flat on their backs, including San Francisco. And the, the trauma of all that, um, there were incredibly repressive measures brought against it. And 
to those measures. And I think we can see a parallel today. It was those repressive measures that made some Americans, some from the libertarian side, but more likely from the liberal side, who had always been with the Wilsons and the Roosevelt, say, no, no, it's not democracy. It's not popular rule because the because the people can be a mob, it's individual rights. And so groups like the ACLU were formed by, um, in that case, mostly by Quakers and by uh, liberal Christians to defend the, 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 the rights of, at first, of people who were conscientious objectors to the war. And then it moved on by the 1920s to defend labor organizers and broadened out beyond a mostly liberal religious movement to include a lot of um, more secular people, but it still was dominated by uh, people who were, had a more liberal view of religion. And Learned Hand, as you mentioned, was one of the people, he was sort of a New York intellectual um, who became a, a, a great judge on the Second Circuit, began speaking out. He helped co-found um, the Nation magazine, one of the big magazines of the day. And that uh, magazine began, uh, became a vocal point. You'd also hear it from um, Walter Lippmann, who was a very influential commentator of the day. And they began speaking out that we need to protect the individual rights against the mob. And now that just hadn't happened before. There were no First Amendment cases um, that had really any teeth with respect to uh, limiting uh, free speech. Uh, free speech was given a very, very narrow scope. It could be restricted for any sort of government interest. And um, uh, at first, the older justices, including Oliver Wendell Holmes, who'd been appointed by uh, Teddy Roosevelt and had himself gone through the horrors of the Civil War way back then, um, they upheld this common view. But gradually, they came around to the view that Somehow, free speech, more than anything else, is at the core of what America and American democracy means. And at the, around the same time, at least the ACLU and a few others were thinking um, that the Establishment Clause, or related to the freedom of speech thing, really meant that, that religion should be kept separate from the government in more ways than they had thought of before, and it was one of the reasons for the test case. But, but the, the separation, the Supreme Court never got around to these, you know, to keep religion out of the public schools until 40 years, or, or at least 30 or 40 years after the time we're talking about. So I think that's an important uh, also context for this discussion because it's all about a law in Tennessee that said you can't teach evolution um, in a public school, basically. That is true, and it, it took even longer because uh, to get to... Um, Establishment Clause. The reason is, is the First Amendment on its face says Congress shall make no law respecting free speech, free press, freedom of religion, uh, establishment of religion, uh, assembly. Congress, that's the key word. Um, originally, it was interpreted only to limit what the federal government could do. And so at the early years, states that didn't apply to the states at all, they could restrict free speech, they could restrict freedom of religion. Indeed, many states continued to have established churches, such as Massachusetts and Connecticut, where government money paid for the ministers well into the 1800s. And, and so by the time of the Scopes trial, they, it was just beginning to be argued. It had actually been argued, but in a minority, by a great justice, Justice Harlan, Justice Harlan argued, well, if the 14th Amendment means anything, the 14th Amendment, which was added in response to slavery after the Civil War, that the states may re not res restrict liberty due process, or take away due process of law. And so what does liberty mean? And so Harlan began arguing that, well, liberty means, well, it means the First Amendment or it means the Bill of Rights, that that should all apply. It was called the Incorporation Doctrine. That should all apply against the states. Well, he, uh, he was in the minority, and he didn't even have homes with him. And, but gradually, the court moved to selective incorporation. That was, well, some of these things maybe are within the rights protected, also against state action. 
And the first one of those occurred in the same, it couldn't affect the Scopes trial because it was the same year. Um, finally, Oliver Wendell Holmes in the Getlow case in 1925 ruled that the First Amendment protection of freedom of speech, not of religion, not, not of free exercise, not of establishment clause, but uh, the, the right of um, uh, free speech was indeed protected by the First Amendment. And that was the, the, the first great victory, but uh, one of the first really great victories by the ACLU. It was an orchestrated strategy by the ACLU, by an elite group of, of uh, mostly liberal, but not all, Americans who were fighting for this new definition of what America meant, that America meant individual liberty. It included other groups as well, certainly the NAACP and others were coordinated. It was a coordinated attack, designed attack. And the Scopes trial fits right into that because when the Scopes trial was orchestrated, Gitlow hadn't been decided, even free speech, and certainly not the Establishment Clause. And so indeed, when they looked at it back then, not the way we view it today, but they viewed it within the ACLU, because it was a it was a setup case by the ACLU. It wasn't a, a organic development in Tennessee. He, Scopes wasn't even actually uh, a biology teacher. He'd never violated the law. But ACLU wanted to test this new law in Tennessee. They were doing it at the exact same time. They were fighting uh, mandatory um, ROTC classes at UCLA. Um, they were fighting cases in San Francisco. All around the country, they were trying to establish the principle, the state, whether it be the University of California system or um, uh, the state of Tennessee, that they too couldn't violate free speech. And so they were viewing this as a free speech case and an academic freedom, much less than they were viewing it as a establishment of religion case. And it was one of a whole array of cases. And they fully believed it would go to the Supreme Court. They didn't think it would be derailed as it was um, by local forces. They had already arranged with Charles Evans Hughes, who was a former justice of the Supreme Court, former Republican nominee for president. He'd stepped down as a Supreme Court justice in, in 1916 to run for um, the president, Republican nominee, he lost to Wilson barely, unexpectedly. He would later, be, he was then, at the time of the Scopes trial, president of the American Bar Association, and he would later become chief justice of the United States Supreme Court. They had him arranged already to argue the Scopes case before the United States Supreme Court, pushing for the free speech issue. Another background issue on, on this, uh, because the case, as you said, uh, some of the legal issues were totally different, but it was framed as a fundamentalist Christian uh, versus Darwinism uh, by some people, you know, as a fight. Um, one thing that was very interesting about your book was you, you say where fundamentalism and the word fundamentalist comes from. But the other thing is, I think uh, that a lot of people would, would, I think that's a little bit more understandable even to modern time. But what I think a lot of people can understand is what the uh, impression that the Darwinists gave at the time, that now it's taken for granted, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it was caught up. I mean, some Darwinists were caught up in eugenics. Some were caught up in, in, in um, uh, really a kind of much harsher idea about the survival of the fittest than we now think about it and so on. Um, and, and even the idea of races and which races are more fit to survive than other ones. So, so it had a lot of pejorative things so that some religious people would say, this is going to make our children cruel. We can't teach that. It's going to make them into cruel people. So uh, maybe a little bit of background about, about maybe the people that were involved, and, and, and uh, that would be interesting because it's very, uh, um, it's very different than the way we look at Darwin is today. Well, yes, and um, actually... Uh, the hardcore fundamentalists today and the creationists try to continue to make that link. They will still try to make the link of Darwinism to eugenics and to, um, to this sort of, and racism, and they'll do it very, very vocally, but they were better able to do it back then. And certainly William Jennings Bryan becoming an advocate of this. Now, William Jennings Bryan, most people don't remember, but he had, he was a, Progressive, progressive. He had been nominated for president by the Populist Party. 
much less than the Progressive Party. He was even more a populist, which is a more radical form of progressivism. He had been nominated for president three times by the Democratic Party. Party. There's never Never been anyone anyone nominated for president three times and never win. Um, He was uh, definitely considered a liberal. Um, He'd been secretary of state uh, uh, under Woodrow Wilson and had resigned in protest of Wilson's drift for the war. He was an um, anti-militarist. So he had this long history of, uh, of, of liberal uh, politics. And he signs, but he was also a conservative Christian. So if you think of somebody sort of in our time, barely, he's still alive, uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, you have to think of somebody like a Jimmy Carter. And he very much, Brian was very much the old school who believed in democracy. He had pushed for initiative a referendum. He had pushed for the right for women to vote. He'd pushed for the direct election for president. He, he was credited with getting more uh, uh, constitutional income tax, more constitutional amendments passed than anybody since James Madison. He was a public crusader. He was a phenomenal orator. He would at, typically give 200 speeches a year, public speeches. He would pack Chautauqua tents, um, any hall he was in. He spoke in San Francisco, often popular speaker in San Francisco. He probably spoke before the Commonwealth Club. Um, and he had a um, an enormous following. And he turned his sights on Darwinism, partly for his religion, that he did think teaching religion in public, teaching Darwinism in public school does lead people away from Christianity. He would take a little bit of that view that we now associate with Richard Dawkins, that um, that evolution um, leads uh, to atheism. Then, but he also thought that it led to this social Darwinism, and uh, that came out of his experience in World War One, where he opposed World War One, along interestingly with um, uh, Clarence Darrow, who's opponent in this trial. And um, he, the Germans in part justified the war on Dar- Darwinist terms, that survival of the fittest and our system is, is more fit than your system. Um, and they did that publicly. And so he, he grabbed onto that. And so he, it not only led people away from faith, but it, um, it led to um, the greatest war in human history, he said. And in addition to that, there were some of the robber barons, some of the labor barons, including um, some in San Francisco, the, some of the Leland Stanfords, but certainly publicly um, uh, Carnegie and Rockefeller, Hill, who built the Northern Pacific Railroad, um, the uh, uh, or the Great Northern Railroad, I think. Um, they all expressly acknowledged that, Dar- that Darwinian struggle for survival justified their treatment of labor. And that bothered him because he was always the candidate for labor. So you draw those. Those are the those are the three biggest sins in in Darwin's political um, uh, uh, religious view. That is in, in, uh, imperialism, uh, uh, militarism, and and uh, and uh, oppression of labor. And so that also was implicated by the teaching of human evolution. So when you combine those two, and then finally, of course, he believed in democracy. And if the good people of Tennessee would adopt the law, and that's what was involved. Well, it wasn't really just the good people of Tennessee. It was his crusade. He came and spoke before a joint session of the Tennessee legislature and got them to pass the bloody law. As he spoke in dozens of other state legislatures, he held big meetings in Tennessee to push for the passage of this law. And when the law was passed, he volunteered his services. He hadn't been in court in in over 40 years. He used to be a DA. Um, He volunteered his services because he saw that the trial itself was such a setup and the local people was were from Republican each Tennessee, and they were making fun of him. He wanted to be there to make sure they'd have a, they would seriously try this guy. Great background. It's one other thing I think for people to understand, and that is how well developed education was at the time. Um, you because we're talking about an, a, a, a subject about education, and uh, you had some really interesting statistics. One was that for the nation in 1890 there were only 200,000 people in high school. And in, in 1920, 30 years later, there were 2 million. Now, partially that was due to the immigration insurgency, but, but still it was a great increase in just people 
um, going to school, high school. And you said in, in Tennessee you had even starker number in, 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 because it was a shorter period of time. In 1910, there were 10,000 students in high school. And in 1925, at the time of the trial, just 15 years later, there were fi over 50,000 people. So more than five times as many within 15 years attended high school. So there was a big push to educate a lot of people. So how you educate this enormous increase um, is, was, was an issue on the table. Uh, the other element that you, you, you quoted Ed Mims uh, uh, stating in 1924 that uh, college professors are like other human beings. Um, it's very hard for them uh, when faced with one extreme to not go all the way to the other. Um, <laughs> which, which was well, The issue on education simply was what drove those numbers that you talk about was compulsory attendance laws. In uh, before, 18, before 1900, the only compulsory attendance laws were for grade school. You only went one, uh, through eighth grade and common schools. That's what they were called then. We now call them elementary. Well, now we split them between in middle school. We invented in between. But there were there were the common school through eighth grade. And that was public education. And then a few a few towns had a maybe one um, high school that was free. And then there were private ones. It'd be some sort of like Boston Latin or something, some sort of communal high school. But high school wasn't the norm. Well, what we changed is we changed into industrial and nation. Um, before 18, before 1900, most people lived on farms. And after 1900, most people didn't live on farms. And then they, to the extent they didn't, they had worked in factories. Now we became a industrial. We found out during the war, we needed a technological elite. We needed people. So we... Um, we, we moved to having uh, high schools. And at Tennessee, in the same Tennessee legislature that passed the anti-evolution law in 1920, in the spring of 1925, also passed compulsory high school. And indeed, it was part of the compromise that they, they went along with compulsory high school with state funding, state funding of high school, um, state funding to support the local high schools. At that time, there'd only been high schools in some of the big cities like Nashville and Knoxville. Uh, and Chattanooga, um, the adding of, uh, uh, of the funding for them. And uh, part of the deal was, okay, well, they won't teach evolution because we, not that they could teach creationism. They, they, Brian was clear on that. They wouldn't teach the other side. There was no creation science back then to teach anyway, um, but not to teach, um, teach evolution. And that was sort of the deal. The, the governor of Tennessee, Austin P. Uh, who was a, really a progressive, uh, and uh, some of your people may, who love college football may have heard of him because of the, they have a college named after Austin P. Austin P. pushed for uh, this high school education. That was his big um, issue. And then he reluctantly had to sign the, the anti-evolution bill to get his bill through. That's great background for the culture of the time because, as I said, I, I think it's hard for people to put themselves back in there. There's a lot of other trends. Uh, so you can set up and understand the the uh, village of Dayton that did this. But then you gave a really good background on Dayton itself, that, it, that uh, the ACLU, uh, which, as you mentioned, was started by Quakers. We don't look, think of the ACLU that way now, but that's, that's what it was, was uh, originated as, that they wanted a test case because of the law having been passed, and they advertised in the newspapers, right, or something like that, so that they could get somebody to, to be the test case. And, and a plot was hatched in Dayton because... Uh, they wanted to bring attention to their relatively new village. Uh, I think it's another great part of the story. And why don't you tell a little bit of that, and then we'll go to some of the characters. Yeah, Dayton, Dayton's not, um, didn't come from, was, was part of East Tennessee. And back then, East Tennessee had been the Republican part of Tennessee. It had opposed joining the Civil War. But Dayton itself didn't even exist um, before 1890. Um, it had been built uh, in so-called New South with Northern money um, going after local. There was assumed to be some coal in the area and they built some blast furnaces to uh, work on, make iron uh, and some industry. It, it, the railroad came through and the railroad made it possible. Also strawberry fields. It's the one thing that survived. They still have great strawberry fields. They have a strawberry festival every year. <laughs> but the Did you research there? Did you go there for research and get some Oh, I've been to Dayton many, many, many times. It's one of the few places I can walk down the street and people recognize me. Um, the, um, 
the uh, the but they had refrigerated uh, rail cars, so they could take the strawberries right up to New York. So this town developed, and it had boomed initially, um, and it had gone up all the way to like three thousand people and become the county seat for uh, Ray County. Um, but then it sort of collapsed, and the 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 iron mills had gone cold. Uh, they weren't as uh, they didn't turn out to be as profitable as the investors had hoped. And so it had lost half its population. The one relic of the earlier period, courtroom in the state of Tennessee, which is just sort of interesting, sort of convenient. Um, so you get to it, you get to this point, and this law has been passed by the state legislature. It didn't come out of Dayton, and it, again, it was passed by a back then a solidly Democratic, pro Bryan, Southern, um, old fashioned Southern Democrats. We're talking about. Um, and uh, Dayton is, had never voted for Bryan in the three elections where he had run. Uh, he'd never gotten a majority of the vote. It was basically a Republican enclave, uh, but they were struggling. And uh, so the ACLU was, as I had mentioned before, was engaged nationwide in looking for cases that they could, that they viewed could put the issue of free speech in a way that the American people would buy it and see why it was important because it doesn't do much. I mean, American people don't want communists to have free speech. They don't want to have labor radicals. They don't want socialists. And those were most of the cases. So they try to find a new group of cases. And so they're fighting, as I say, the uh, ROTC and uh, in um, and UCLA, they're fighting um, people, uh, religious people who are opposed saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, they're trying to think of things that, that resonate and here they see it. Now, it's well, not only Tennessee, the William Jennings Bryan, when he does anything, he does it nationwide. And he'd been crusading for about three years to get anti-evolution laws. He'd spoken all over the country. And there'd been, so it had become a national phenomenon. There were bills up in places like Minnesota and Ohio and in um, uh, Kentucky and out West, different places, Washington state. And chance, and how they saw it was, we're going to let the mob, the the people, pass a law restricting the teaching in high school, because that's the only place it real. It applied to colleges too, public colleges, but ra realistically, it only applied to high schools. You don't teach evolution in in great in common schools anyway. And the 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 most the all the high school textbooks at the time were strictly evolutionary because evolution totally dominated the scientific worldview at the time totally. And the the most common textbook in America, Hunter's Civic Biology, the one used in all of Tennessee by state law, um, was the most common in America. It was written by George Hunter from um, at Columbia University. You're going to have the mob, the people, like pass a law saying they can't teach, and that they thought could resonate with American people better than a t a protecting some socialist or radical or anarchist. And so, and it did work because they put together, you couldn't believe, they put together support committees, of course, from the San Francisco area. The president of, of Stanford uh, jumps right on the uh, advisory committee for the Scopes trial, David Starr Jordan, as does the president of Harvard and the president of Columbia and well, the center of the tension, I suppose, would have been uh, Scopes. And you, you mentioned John Scopes looking older. He was just, he had just graduated a year before from the University of Kentucky and was signed on to coach the football team, as well as to teach back as typical still today, teaching uh, middle school science and whatever else. Um, so he wasn't a biology teacher, uh, but he was chosen for the job he would never have instigated such a trial. But since the ACLU was at actually advocating and seeking um, defendants, and so they asked him if he'd stand trial because they thought, well, this sort of summer, we don't know if the law is legal or not. Um, let's, uh, let's see if we can bring in the ACLU and um, have a trial. And in fact, the way they were thinking was when they originally designed it, um, they sent off letters saying, well, if we indict Scopes, who, again, volunteered to agree, he never spent any time in jail. Um, they, they sent off letters to H.D. Uh, um, uh, Wells, who has been a speaker, I know, back in the early days of the Commonwealth Club, right. one of the great writers of, of the day. 
And they sent him a letter in England saying, would, they, would he handle the, the defense, figuring he'd be a big, big draw on the one side. Um, of course, uh, the ACLU had other ideas. And they put together this stellar tri trial team with uh, Clarence Darrow, the most famous trial lawyer in America at the time, the criminal defense lawyer, and, and Arthur Garfield Hayes, the great uh, Wall Street uh, 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 lawyer who also was a defender of, of labor unions all around the country and on the leader of the ACLU. And, and um, um, Dudley Field Malone, who'd been a, uh, assistant uh, secretary of state under Scopes under uh, William Jennings Bryan in the in 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 the Wilson administration and was then um, probably the highest paid divorce lawyer in America and a and a Catholic. They put together this incredible team and these expert witnesses from all over America. These top scientists and theologians, all of whom were were, were Christians who accepted the theory of evolution from places like like uh, Princeton and and Hopkins and and um, uh, Michigan, places like this, um, to come in and present their case. Um, the um, the defense uh, was so strong that the prosecution was quickly overwhelmed. And uh, William Jennings Bryan, of course, volunteered, but he had a devil of a time. I guess I shouldn't say that about Bryan, good religious person uh, that he was. I had a devil of a time finding anybody, any scientist who'd come in and take his side. He couldn't find any. Um, actually, and um, or even theologians to take his side. Um, but of course, the state's prosecutor, prosecutorial team came in and uh, the state's attorney general, who would later serve in the U.S. Senate, uh, was there. Uh, and they had the, on the defensive. Now, the, the press loved it. And uh, reporters came from all over the world, literally the world. Um, to cover it. All the best reporters, many of the best reporters in America, um, um, uh, Joseph Wood Critch, um, you just name them, they headed down there um, and um, to, to cover it. Hundreds of reporters. They also laid thousands of miles of telegraph wire so they could telegraph out from the courtroom every word as it was spoken. They let they put the telegraphs because even the judge did not, this wasn't a serious trial. This was a this was a this was a an educational event to debate the merits of the law. They built an airfield in Dayton so they could because they they filmed the entire trial and they built a built a airfield. They cut down a cornfield really and had an airfield so they could fly out the film every night and show it in movie halls in Cleveland and in New York and in other cities. Uh, eventually in San Francisco, um, they'd finally get out west. It takes, takes a while, but the next day they'd show it. It dominated. You could look at the San Francisco papers or the LA papers for that week. Every word, the front page was just a transcript of the trial. This was, this was the two most famous speakers in America by far. Nobody touched William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow as public speakers. They could fill any hall. They both published books. They both published um, articles. Um, they, were, they were larger than life. We don't have any. Uh, uh, um, uh, certainly, we don't have any attorney of that caliber, of that dominance, of that po uh, uh, popularity today. And then you add a, a, a William Jennings Bryan on the other side. And you had a show, and these local civic leaders who had originally designed it as a PR stunt for their town could only shake their head and say, wow, this is more than we ever expected. The problem was, and you alluded to it, the problem was yeah. they viewed it as a free speech trial and an academic freedom trial. Uh, we, we, we have a couple of comments that have come in from our audience. Yeah. Um, one of them said that William Jennings Bryan did speak at the Commonwealth Club on June 26, 1920, uh, and his speech was The Coming Democratic Platform. And Clarence Darrow spoke here on May 14, 1932, on The World Today. So both of them came and spoke here. So here we, you can talk about these characters. This is, these are pictures from the trial itself. It was, of course, there were reporters. And this is Clarence Darrow at the trial. This is what he looked like at this time. The year before, he'd done the... Uh, that most famous murder trial probably of the century, the Leopold Loeb trial in Chicago. 
Uh, that had garnered attention. Uh, the, the Sweet Brothers trial was coming the year later where he defended uh, the black dentist who had defended his home in Detroit. Um, but of course, he had had a whole string of famous cases by then. And you can sort of see this sort of this look. Um, but this is how he looked at the trial. And he uh, he was treated very well um, at the trial. They they provided fresh vegetables for him. The local townspeople provided vegetables fresh vegetables for him. He was, he was more than a trial lawyer, though. He was a, he was a public intellectual who wrote books and articles um, and essays. And he was also sort of the equivalent of the uh, Richard Dawkins of the day and that he was a, a public agnostic who would argue. He argued for sort of a libertarian form of government in a lot of speeches, but he also argued against Christianity. He viewed Christianity as a source of a war and division, and he had very much a secular, evolutionary view of life, and that's why he cared so much about this particular trial. This is, uh, and this, and, and I'll have to agree with you here. Scopes looks very young here, but here you see him standing among his part of his trial team. That's Dudley Field Malone to his um, uh, right, um, and Scopes in the middle. That Brian, and that's at the trial. Uh, and and Brian should be in the next picture. You can see him squinting away. This is him caught in the sunshine with the sun uh, bouncing off his now bald head when he didn't have his pith helmet on. This is on the stand when in the famous last day of the trial, Darrow calls him to the stand to defend his law and ask him questions about um, the Bible and biblical literalism. And Brian is there caught collar off because it's beastly hot. Um, it's hot and sunny and warm, and uh, they're baking in the courtroom. They move out to the outside. That's why you can sort of see the outside behind. I think some more slides will show that even more. I thought it was, it was very interesting that he died about a week after the trial. Yes, as it's presented in Inherit the Wind, he dies as a direct result of being ridiculed at the trial. Um, but that's just uh, movie drama. Um, actually, it's um, the following Sunday, and he'd spent the week in Dayton. Uh, he had a brilliant closing argument that he was never allowed to give, but he had already right. planned a nationwide speaking tour, and it was, he, it was published during the week. He gave, it, he gave the speech a couple times in Tennessee, and he was preparing to to leave for that speech, but the the heat, no one knows if it's the heat, the stress, the adverse press, um, just the pressure. But he was a diabetic; uh, he had heart problems, and he died in his sleep on Sunday after church. It's interesting. You said he, he had this closing argument. You, you mentioned in the book how how uh, Daryl cut him off from giving that closing argument. But of course, like any good speechwriter, right. he used it uh, to to. Uh, give a series of talks. It became one of his stump speeches. But here, the next picture, I think this is, this, this is Daryl again, right? This picture captures Darryl it perfectly. It, it, you couldn't have, we couldn't have designed this better. Um, this is um, uh, Daryl cutting him off. Um, on the last day, the plan was that Brian would give, uh, the defense would give its closing argument and Brian would give his closing argument. And Brian um, had not handled most of the trial because Brian was not a practiced practicing attorney. Uh, he hadn't tried cases in years. And so he left that to Tom Stewart, the very, very able uh, local uh, prosecutor. Actually, he was a state attorney general from Nashville. Did a beautiful job, really, if you were a lawyer following it. But Brian had spent weeks honing. Brian was better as a stump speaker. And he had honed together a... A, a powerful speech that he planned to give to the, to the jury in the courtroom. Uh, and the assembled, uh, you know, the, broad, the trial was broadcast live on the radio. It was the first broadcast uh, trial in American history. And so it was to the listening audience around America. And in that um, speech, um, which we have and is considered one of his finest by people who study um, speeches and matters like that, uh -huh. um, he brought together his whole case uh, against uh, the teaching of evolution and uh, indicted um, and the defense of majoritarian democracy, that the taxpayers should be able to decide what is taught in their classrooms. Um, well, there's a little trick that in Tennessee, and, and uh, Clarence Darrow was a, a better lawyer. And, you know, there's an old saying by Will Rogers 
that the American legal system is the greatest engine ever designed by the mind of man to determine who has the best lawyer. That certainly was the case here because Clarence Darrow knew that under Tennessee jurisprudence, if you waive your, if the defense waives its closing arguments, then the prosecution can't give its closing arguments. And so Darrow had worked all of his closing arguments into various speeches for various reasons and various motions during the trial. And so he then waives his closing argument. And uh, poor Brian is left without the ability to give his closing speech in the courtroom, a speech he has practiced and was going to then take around the country. He would still take it around the country. But all that occurred outside. And you see Darrow here standing with trees in the background because it had gotten so hot, hot in the courtroom. And the judge who was up for reelection thought that all that was left were the closing arguments. And he knew that everyone wanted to hear it. Well, the courtroom, even though the courtroom was very large, largest trial courtroom in the state of Tennessee, it wasn't large enough to hear, include anybody except the press and the jury and the uh, lawyers. And so the townspeople couldn't get in to watch. And he wanted, of course, the townspeople to see it. And of course, it was unbeastly hot up there in the courtroom. And so he used a pretext that uh, cracks had appeared in the floor underneath uh, the courtroom, that maybe it was too heavy, maybe too many people. Uh, there's uh-huh. no basis for that. Uh, right. And he adjourned to outside for what he thought would be the closing arguments. And there was, they built a bandstand on the side of the courtroom, courthouse. And so suddenly, instead of the 200 people in the courthouse, um, they had 3,000 people, twice the town's population, poured in. Here you get an oversized picture of them on this outside. There were there were 3,000 people. Everybody in town poured out because um, to, they'd been listening to it on the radio. Uh, poured out to hear this. People drove in. Um, women could come. Uh, uh, African Americans could come. It, it was open. People went through the 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 the, the people hawking beverages, um, <laughs> selling food. It was a carnival, and they thought they were going to get the closing speeches. But what they did was that Darrow calls Brian to the stand as an expert on the Bible. Um, and Brian doesn't have to go. And the fact the judge says, you don't have to testify. And the, his, the prosecutor is, is flailing, saying, don't go there, no. But Brian, who's been badgered throughout the whole trial as an ignoramus by, by the pro- uh, defense, agrees to go up to def- as long as he could then, cro- then examine Darrow. And he figures Darrow's going to ask him the questions um, like about evolution, because that's what the case was allegedly about. Uh But no, Darrow's too smart for that. Darrow knows what every trial lawyer does. You never ask a question. If you're a if you're a lawyer, you never ask a question where possibly the answer could hurt you. Um, you can only answer questions that can help you. So he asked things like the age of the earth and um, um, uh, uh, do you believe that the earth was 10,000 years ago? Does this, did, did it, oh, like, where did Cain get his wife? If he was the, the first, um, uh, if he was the child of Adam and Eve, where did his wife come from to have children? Um, cause they don't talk about a female descendant. They ask about, did Joshua lengthen the day by making the sun stand still or the earth stand still? Questions about flat earthism, all these things that he knew. Because he was, he had been fighting fundamentalism for a lifetime. He um, he knew that there was no good answer to these questions. That either you would agree to the to this, what would seem to Americans this ridiculous idea, and therefore appear to be a fool, or you deny them, and then you say, well, if you deny that in the Bible, well, why can't why can't you teach evolution? He knew he had him either way. Right. And it was a it was a, a a massacre. And here's the two men, right? And this is them. This is the famous picture of them. Uh, Darrow, of course, classically with a cigarette, and uh, Brian with a fan, um, sitting there with their collars off, um, the suspenders in the um, in the in the um, courtroom. Well, we have about seven or eight minutes left, and I'd like to get to some uh, big issues and and uh, about what. What's going on now um, and how it, this applies. And y- as, you, as you write, this was really about uh, individual liberty versus majoritarian democracy. And, and we set the stage earlier about how 
this was a relatively new idea that individual liberties were part of what the Bill of Rights was about, not, not just um, the overall democratic principles. So um, you, you have, a, uh, in your afterward as well, you have a, a couple of statues that got set up, and maybe we can go to those pictures and then go to the other. There's the courthouse. It's still there. And indeed, right. our listeners can go there every summer. I think it's canceled this summer because of the pandemic. But every summer they put on the trial. But they put on their own edited version of the trial, a one night trial. It goes on several days. They have the Scopes Festival. And in their trial, of course, Brian wins uh, because it is Dayton, Tennessee. And Dayton, Tennessee has become a much more religious place than it was back then. And in honor of Brian, who died there, they've raised funds and there's a Brian College there. And the Brian College uh, put up a statue to William Jennings Bryan a few years ago in front of the courtroom. But it shows him as a young man, as a top orator and with the with the courtroom behind. And then um, when that was put up, the local um, clerk of court said, well, I doubt if I doubt if they'll I'll doubt if there'll ever be any movement to get a picture of or raise similar funds to get Clarence Darrow here. But he didn't understand how much this trial resonates um, in America. And immediately the Freedom from Religion Society um, Start launched a fundraiser to counter this statue with the one you see in the next slide, which is Clarence Darrow in all of his glory, uh, pulling on his suspenders, or actually they're galoshes because they're wider, um, in that with that shock of hair that he famously has. And he's on the other side, but he's like he's pointing at Brian and as if he wants to call him back to that cross examination. The cross examination yeah. itself occurred only a few feet behind where you see Darrow here. Just where you see the edge of the courthouse, it was on that side of the courthouse, just a back a few feet was where the um, where the, the, the stands were, where they stood, the, the bandstand. And the crowd would have been in this whole area where you see Clarence Darrow now standing. So uh, wonderfully, the two of them are now facing each other um, actually, if you do see the statutes, they got a much better architect. And I think they had more money behind the Darrow stand. But the town, to their credit, despite local opposition, the t um, still still hoping to cash in on the history of this trial. There's a trial museum in the in the courtroom um, and they, the, the legacy of this. They have um, they, they did accept both to their credit. And you can get a little feel for the tension that lives there by a, if you're driving around East Tennessee for some reason, stopping in Dayton, getting a nice, great, big piece of sweet potato pie and uh, watching this. You mentioned earlier, Ed, uh, that, that uh, there, you know, WGN, I think, was the station from Chicago that was covering it by radio. And they have a recording of it. Is that available on the Internet of these? Um, yes. Um, what they have is, no, they don't have a recording. They recorded the trial. It was broadcast. Uh, but despite the best efforts of me and many other people, we have never been able to find any of the saved recording. And it wasn't just to Chicago. It was a nationwide hookup. But what you do have and what you can get on the Internet, it was the entire trial was filmed. And the film is pretty much a, a big chunks of the film are available from inside the courtroom. Um, in fact, if you see pictures of the trial, you can see the cameras in the background. And the Smithsonian owns a lot of the trial, uh, various individuals. And every now and then you see coming up on eBay a chunk of the, the, uh, the film. Uh, wow. So you can you can watch the trial, but you can't and you can read the transcript alongside, which was how they saw how he went and saw it in San Francisco. People would go down to a movie theater and they'd see the film of the trial and in San Francisco or in Los Angeles or Seattle or Portland or wherever. And then um, readers would read the, the version because uh, the transcript was widely available. So still silent film uh, in 1925. Silent, correct. Uh, it was a couple more years before they had. Oh, so. Uh, just a couple of minutes on, on, on this big idea. I mean, our society has a large number of subcultures, you could say. And, and fundamentalists are still a big subculture of American society. And the scientists, uh, of course, and the scientific approach is, is an ever, ever you know, more dominant one in its way in mm -hmm. secular society. 
Is there, is there anything to learn from this? Because first of all, uh, it was, because it was a set-up trial, there wasn't a lot of animosity between the sides uh, at the basis of it. The, 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 uh, the idea later on uh, uh, from the movie and everything showed more anger and more animosity, but you showed a picture of, of uh, Darrow and William Jennings Bryan sitting next to each other, you know, kind of, kind of each helping each other's fame by, be <laughs> by being involved in the trial. So... Um, I'm, I'm oh, sort of actually, curious. I'm sort of curious about, you know, I mean, the, the democratic model should be that that uh, we tolerate all subcultures that don't really cause serious issues. I mean, we obviously, you know, I mean, like uh, like murder and rape and so on. You, you can't we can't tolerate a subculture that prefers that. Um, but otherwise, uh, even though we don't tolerate every subculture, there doesn't seem to be any legal or democratic reason not to. The trial does, and you you picked up on it when you mentioned that the. the Inherit the Wind, that great play, longest running play in Broadway history at that time, uh, and then picked up as a movie with uh, Spencer Tracy. Um, that presents a very different trial. There they show the mob. The mob is there. The mob is the center. The movie was actually written against as a, as a McCarthyism, and it was a throwback, sort of like um, The Crucible, by, uh, which was done in the same fashion, where we're going to take this old trial and bring it up to date to try to expose McCarthyism. That's the story we remember. And in many ways, the Scopes trial launched the, the culture wars because Brian was so savagely treated by the press because the press was already lined up to defend freedom of religion. And so Brian was just in the crosshairs. And as a reaction, fundamentalism and evangelical Christianity to largely pulled out. They thought, we're gonna get, we're gonna get pummeled. We can't trust the fake media. And we're gonna build our own colleges, like Bryan College, but like right. lots of other colleges all around. One's right here, right in here in San Francisco, or down here, like Biola, down here in Los Angeles. Um, and we're gonna have our own high schools, we're gonna have our own camps. We're going to split the churches, split the Presbyterian church among a conservative and a liberal branch, split the, you know, divide up. And suddenly these culture wars start in many ways with the public reaction to the Scopes War. And then you get to the 50s when you have communism thrown in and the second Red Scare. And, and you have Billy Graham lining up, we're going to fight communism. And you have uh, under God, added to the Pledge of Allegiance. It wasn't there before the 50s. Um, and you have this growing division between this, this public evangelicalism and fundamentalism. And it carries this memory of the Scopes trial with it. And the, the, the secular side views Scopes becomes the equivalent of Galileo. Um, you know, here he was a little high school teacher, and Galileo yeah, was one yeah. of the great scientists <laughs> of all time. And so you have... You have this becomes part of the part of the you know like the ping pong ball being hit back and forth, and the story keeps growing and the culture wars keep growing, but it it does end up having the issue. You say, yeah, sure, if people don't want to do things, they don't want to do things. But if you end up putting science as against religion, if this becomes the America story of science versus, which wasn't around before the 1920s. There wasn't a right. sense that religion opposed science or science opposed religion. Well, then you're setting the groundwork for evangelicals opposing climate change science, um, opposing vaccinations, um, uh, uh, modern medicine. Um, you have possibilities coming out in a whole, because you're distrusting expertise in general. And so the Scopes trial continues to resonate because those issues are still relevant today. And yeah, you say in one way it doesn't hurt anyone, but if people don't get, if we ever do get a vaccination for COVID, if people choose not to get it, well, they're endangering other people. As you point out, I mean, it was a media event and the media, you know, um, was always driven by certain incentives. Um, and uh, we, we certainly know that. Uh, from the 1990s when they lost out to cable TV that they had to focus more on sports and politics um, to keep the revenue generating. And uh, it's not the only element involved, but all of those different cultural elements twist together to, to create this. You see the birth of this and the media, the media more than anybody is to blame this, an adversarial event and pushing the culture wars. 
So since the Commonwealth Club is devoted to to a rational discussion of ideas, we should keep the media out. No, I'm just <laughs> you should you should invite both Darrow and Brian to speak, which you did, which we did. Yes. Um, so uh, just one before uh, thanking you, one one last little detail, which was just great in your book, was about Billy Sunday, who was the, a precursor to Billy Graham, basically um, a big preacher. Um, and he had 18 days, you said, 18 days of revival meetings in town. One night was for men only. One was for women only. Uh, there was an African-American night. I mean, the guy was just taking in every group he could. Um, and I, I thought that was just a, such a funny little detail. And there's so many more in your book. So thanks a lot for writing it uh, 20 years ago or so. And uh, it, it deserved all the awards it got. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. Well, so, thank you for having me. And I'm sorry for any sort of... Ec- uh, electrical glitches and getting it through, but it's the Commonwealth Club is a national treasure. I'm always happy to support. Have me back anytime you want. So thank you again. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion.